to sing here in the shower. It's all right. Okay. <laughs> it's kind of embarrassing sometimes. Are you aware? I have a little note here from the New York Times. Uh, Incidentally, I, I uh, love those little squibs at the Times. The, the Times has better squibs at the bottom of it than most papers. You know the little fillers? Sometimes I don't read the news in the paper. I just read the fillers because you really get great stuff. For example, here's one. It says, bread mold was successfully applied to wounds long before penicillin was discovered. Now, uh, obviously, some you know some guy in the, way back in the ancient days, he had this bread that was moldy. And, of course, that's happened to me many times. You know, moldy bread. And uh, he... Uh, inadvertently applied it to a wound, which could have come from a fist fight or a knife fight or what, you know. Well, after all, this was the early days, a lot of fist fights and knife fights and stuff. And the next thing you know, the wound healed it over, and then that naturally led to the bread mold thesis of how to cure wounds. Of course, it killed as many as it cured, because there's not all, there's the, several kinds of bread molds, you know, friends. <laughs> you put a little, a little wrong mold on there, you're going to turn green, and your teeth are going to glow in the dark, and that's the end of the ball game. But that's something else, see? And that's the way it is with all great discoveries. Now, if you're interested in my great discovery, uh, I, I, I might as well tell you how it happened. I'm, I'm uh, at the age of ten. I became a fantastically dedicated uh, model maker. I'm talking about model airplanes. We didn't have the other kind of models in Hammond, Indiana, but I, I was a dedicated model maker. And uh, it came about when I was making one specific model. I can even tell you what the airplane was, in case you're curious. If you're, you know, the technical-minded always. No matter what story you tell, you're going to get some angry letter from some guy. What do you mean? I was looking up the thing, by, and then, well, there was no Stinson SR2, blah, blah. Well, all right. This, the model that I made was the Stinson Reliant. I was building a Stinson Reliant, which was a high-winged monoplane uh, with the gull wings, uh, for the really technical minded, gull wing configuration. Uh, it had a, uh, a single rotary type engine in it, and I was building this model. It was a Migal kit. You're curious what kit it was? 17 inch wingspan Stinson SR7 Reliant. Now, you see, I, I got an unbelievable memory for this kind of crud, and I, I just wish I could remember good stuff once in a while. I, I'll tell you, if somebody jumped right up out of the audience right now, and ask me anything out of all my entire college career, if I remembered, I wouldn't. I mean, I don't remember, I, I don't think I learned anything <laughs> in, in school. Do you, well, I mean, seriously. And, uh, but I did learn, you know, all this kind of stuff, like the little trivia stuff like that. It was the Stinson SR7, the Stinson Reliant. And I remember that number is emblazoned in my mind, the SR7. By the way, it was an unsuccessful Stinson model. They didn't make many of them, but I remember vividly. So, I'm down in the basement. We had a card table, right? And uh, this is what I built model airplanes. Now, you know the kind of card table that ladies use for bridge games in the afternoon? My mother had one of these regular card tables with that kind of black leatherette top and had these four legs that folded down, and it was green. It was painted. It was dark green-colored legs. It was a pretty card table. It had a, had a green frame around it and leatherette top. Well, I want to tell you, that card table caused more hell so anyway, I'm sitting down in a basement, my mother's card table, and it was on a Saturday afternoon. She was out, and I, you know, this is a great table to make model airplanes on because it had a leatherette top. Now, what does this mean to you? Well, a leatherette top, you can stick pins in, right? Well, <laughs> and it was her, her beautiful card table, which she used when Mrs. Bruner would come over and Mrs. Schwartz and, and uh, also uh, Mrs. Anderson would come over and every... Uh, Wednesday afternoon, they would have the meaning of their little bridge dinghy there. They'd sit together and they'd eat that. Well, actually, they didn't play much bridge, but they ate a lot of bridge mix. And they would sit and eat bridge mix and jabber away there and talk about permanence and stuff like that. And it was unbelievably boring. I remember as a kid, I used to get really bored when they'd be there. I don't know why, just seeing them do this was boring. So, uh, nevertheless, she had this beautiful card table, which she bought at the furniture store, minus furniture store, and it had the leather at top and it was nice. It had imitation leathers. It had this pebbled quality to it, see? So, 
About two weeks after she got it, I figured, you know, that's a great table to make a model airplane on. And I took it down to the basement one Saturday when she was not home, and I unfolded the plans, which was a great big sheet of paper, you see. And this was a model that I had gotten for my birthday, and I was really, you know, so really excited about making this model. And I took the plans, and I unfolded them, and I smoothed them out on the table, and I had one of these little paper things full of thumbtacks. And I took one thumbtack up in the upper left-hand corner, one at the upper right-hand corner, and one at the lower left-hand corner, and now I have the plans thumbtack to the table. Right? I'm ready to work. It's all smooth and nice. And so there it is now. It's just, I'm going to start now. Uh-huh. I think I'll start by building uh, the wings, okay? All right, I'll start with the wings. And so I cut a piece of... Uh, uh, eighth-inch balsa of wood to make the uh, leading edge, and I cut a piece of eighth-inch balsa. Well, actually, that was the trailing edge. They had quarter-inch balsa for the leading edge. So I put quarter-inch balsa, the eighth-inch balsa. Now I'm cutting out the ribs, and I'm pinning, each pinning each one, incidentally, to the plans. I stick a pin through this, each one. Pin, pin, pin. So I'm putting the pins in there, each one of these pins down. Now I've got an entire wing laid out. This has taken me about an hour and a half. I've got this wing all pinned down. Now it's beautiful. So I... Take my jug of glue, my airplane dope, you know, that clear dope, open it up, and uh, remember, I'm in the basement, see, the basement's all enclosed down there, and I'm down there next to the coal bin, and I take a piece of balsa wood, which I was using as a dabber to uh, put my glue on, I dab in, a little down here, a little more there, and the glue is smelling up, you know, I love the smell of this stuff, you know, it's a smell coming up, and uh, like a lot of kids, I wonder how many kids also like the smell of gasoline. Uh, this is a, you know, part of the same syndrome. You do, do you, Al? You don't? Oh, okay. So, <laughs> Eric Matt was on hang up. And he, Al likes boiled cabbage smell. So, I keep adding, adding this little glue down here and the smell's coming up. Ah, now I have one complete wing, all glued and it's waiting there. See, it's gonna dry. It's all glued and all pinned down. Now, I move over to the other side of the plant. I move my seat over to the other side. I'm sitting on a barrel. See, I got a barrel full of nails the old man had. And uh, I'm sitting on the other side, and I begin to work on the tail section, the rudders. So I cut out the pieces of the rudder, R1, stands for rudder, see, R1, R2, R3, and I pin each one down. Pin it down, more glue, more glue. I put the glue in there, now it's dry, now I'm waiting. I blow on it a little bit, and uh, all the while, my open jug of glue is sitting there right in front of me, see, the fumes are coming <laughs> I'll tell you, this is a true story because, wow, it was, it was a, it was a wild afternoon because uh, I had never, uh, up to this point, I had never built a model airplane in the basement. All my model airplanes I built up in the front bedroom. I had a bedroom where I used to stay, in my bedroom. So. But this bedroom up there had about nine windows and there were doors and everything else, you see, so there was plenty of air. I just, you know, so I'm down in the basement now and there's nothing but concrete cement block walls all around me, see, with a little tiny window way down at the other end, you see, and you could see nothing but the, what was left of the hose sticking through it, you know, with the, <laughs> where they sprinkled the lawn, and that was about it, see. Nothing but old used tires piled up in the corner. And you know how basements get real close, see. And I'm down there working away. <laughs> and now I'm, I, I take the, the, the wing, you see. This is now the left half of the wing. Very carefully, I pull the pins on. And now I carefully strip it off of the plants, and there is my beautiful wing. It's beautiful. The, the, the uh, skeleton of the wing is now done and complete. I put it over to one side, and I start to work on the right side of the wing. I'm pinning them down, cutting the pieces, more glue, more glue, more glue. And I began to get drowsy. It was the first indication that something was strange. I began to feel kind of drowsy. My eyes are getting very heavy. Just a terrific drowsiness. I'm sitting there, and uh, just kind of drooping a little bit. And at the same time, I was feeling not only drowsy, but I, there was a peculiar kind of, how can I say it, a warm elation. <laughs> what I didn't know, friends, was that I was higher than a kite. Higher, I was bombed out of my skull. And I'm about ten years old, sitting down there, just completely all by myself, making a very important scientific discovery, which at this point had not been made by many people, and had never been even heard of by me. So totally, uh, and, you know, of course, great minds all work independently. Uh, that, no doubt all over the world there were great minds that were arriving at the same conclusion. So I'm pinning this thing down, 
And I'm sitting there sort of bombed out like that, and I start taking the rudder off of the plans, and everything's getting a little slower, and I'm pulling the rudder off the plans. And I hear these footsteps coming down the basement steps. And then suddenly, without any warning, I hear a fantastic yell of rage. And out of the peculiar purple miasma that I was living in down in the basement now, bombed out of my sconce, I could see my mother holding a shopping bag. She is standing in the dim light of the basement, looking in my direction with two evil red coals that somehow replaced her eyes, gleaming at me. My idiot! Look what you did to my card table! My card table! What, what? What? Look at the pinholes all over it. Look, you've cut it with the razor blade. There were pins. Then I realized I saw it there through the haze. Just what's the matter with you? Sit up straight. What? 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 I was bombed out of my skull. I stagger upwards. Just look what you did to my. Look at my beautiful card table. Look at this. You ruined it. You've got pins all over. What's this glue? Ooh, what's that smell? What's that smell? I said, that's a, Mom, I said, that's my airplane glue. Why don't you stay down and sniff a little of it? It smells real good, don't it? Because you see, when you're bombed out, nothing bothers you. Nothing. And here's my mother throwing a fantastic fit, and she swatted me on the bottom, and all I did was, <laughs> somehow it seemed very funny. <laughs> That was, that was, you're hearing a confession, which I shouldn't really make, I'm sure, that I don't want to lead any of you into trying this because it was bad news. May I tell you what happened, though, hours later, in case you're curious. <laughs> My mother got so bugged, she dragged the table with the, you know, trailing the plans, the whole bit. She dragged it upstairs. I don't know what she figured she could do, you know. She's going to cover it with oil cloth or something. She's going to put oil cloth on the top of where the pinholes were. And I'm... Sitting down in the basement amid the rubble of my Stinson Reliant SR7 kit. And I go dragging upstairs, still bombed out of my skull, and I flop down on the day bed. And all the while, my mother's raging. You see, nothing gets people madder than to try to impose a punishment on somebody, and all I do is laugh. I mean, this, this, this really got her mad. And I could hear a lot of yelling in the kitchen, you know. <laughs> and I'm lying on the day bed. And then, without warning, it hit me. You see, for every action, there is a reaction. For every good, there is an evil. Now, this is not an easy thing to accept. Because, it, uh, you know, it, 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 it gives you bad vibrations, if I may use a current cliché. I mean, to, to think that if you're going to get bombed out of your head, then, you know, it's going to be groovy and wonderful. You don't want to accept the fact that there's another thing going to happen. Now, you may not be able to anticipate it in the beginning. In fact, you don't even want to concede that this is so. But it is inevitably thus. Every great philosopher throughout the ages has said one thing. Ye shall pay. <laughs> Ye shall pay. Correct him all, Al? Well, now, a lot of people don't want to buy this. What do you mean, pay? What is it, some kind of a religious cuckoo? No, nothing to do with religion. We're discussing a philosophical fact. There's nothing whatsoever to do with religion. For every action, there is a reaction. What was his name? Clarence W. Newton, I believe, came up with that. In Pitcairn, Pennsylvania, in the fall of 1887. Known as Clarence Newton's Hypothesis. And uh, what does it say, roughly? Well, you're going to get it in the end, friend. Well, I am lying on the daybed discovering that because all of a sudden, out of the blue, I began to have a headache that extended from roughly the center of my cranium out to quite possibly 35th Street and Shields Avenue, where the White Sox Park was on the 
north end of the scale, and on the south end to roughly the outskirts of Indianapolis. On the west, the uh, headache extended just to the edge of the border, just right to the edge of the border of the Iowa state line, all the way on the east to quite conceivably Mishawaka, Indiana, which was right near Michigan. What a headache, oh my. And then after that, the secondary effects began to set in. I jumped up off the daybed, staggered around in my bedroom for about two and a half minutes before I could find the door, and then I took off for the john. <laughs> It's coming out of my ears, my eyeballs. Wow. Stuff is coming up that I had for dinner when I was four. I could not stop. My mother comes running in. What's the matter? What's the matter? I didn't mean. Don't don't worry about. Don't worry about the car table. What's the matter? She's putting cold things on my head. Oh, did I make you sick? Oh, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have really said all those bad things. Don't worry. We can get a new car table. Don't die. And I'm purple and green. I'm falling. Have you ever had a true attack of total nausea when you're laying on the floor and you're hanging on to the base of the john? <laughs> just lay there with your feet, with your feet hanging down around the, around the radiator. Just nothing. You just can't even get up. You're so weak. And my mother's putting cold compresses on my head. Wah, wah, wah. And it's still coming out. Well, I was wheeled off to bed after I had heaved my guts out. Now, this may be in bad taste, friends, but I'm telling you, so are the secondary effects of any groovy thing you find yourself involved in. <laughs> if you don't think so, speak to bad taste. This is WOR New York. I am in bed. Well, the next morning I wake up, and I'm... The next morning, I'm, uh, Nick, you just missed it. I'm just telling a story about how when I was a kid, I discovered the principle of glue sniffing. And I got higher than a kite making a Stinson SR7 model. And then for 18 hours after that, I'm so sick I can't see the walls. I'm telling you, I heave my guts all over the floor. And then the next morning, I wake up and I'm still sick. Now, I didn't know when I'm 10, I have the first... Let's put it this way, pre-adolescent hangover discovered in our neighborhood up to that point. My head was like one giant boil about to burst, you know. It was a boil coming to a head, my head. Fantastic. Wow. And, of course, there was still the uh, wrecked card table hanging around the edges. I had wrecked the card table making the model, sticking pins in the top of the leatherette. And the old man is sitting at the kitchen. It was, it was Sunday morning. Now, Sunday was a special day in our house, like all Sundays are. It was a day when the old man would sleep late and eat breakfast and read the Chicago Tribune sports section all at the same time sitting in his underwear, right? That was what Sunday morning meant. And that he's sitting out there at the kitchen table, because usually he was out of the crack of dawn. He's gone. I never saw him. And a kid, here it is, it's Sunday morning. He's sitting there at the table. And I come to the kitchen table. Now, I'm ten, roughly. And I'm still thinking that tomorrow I'm going to finish my Stinson model. The headache is still there. Kids, you know, kids are very nonchalant about sickness, you know, they, about illnesses. They can take anything. You tell a kid he's got bubonic plague. Yeah, you know, so what, you know? <laughs> Especially the male types. And you know, you've got bubonic plague. You can't play second base. And, ah, come on, you know. Well, I'm sitting there with this headache while my mother is over the sink. See, she's working away with a Brillo pad. And my kid brother is sitting down there. He's eating away. I sit down to the kitchen table. She puts a bowl of Quaker oats in front of me. And this was a big special, kind of a big special Sunday treat. Hot Quaker oats with uh, brown sugar on the top and butter. And some, some half and half cream. Oh, great. See, I sit down. Now, this was one of my favorite dishes. Because my mother always said it sticks to the ribs. As a matter of fact, it does. I, I wonder how many people are going to be found with... You know, when the, when the final roll call is uh, called, they're going to be found with little uh, uh, Quaker Road footballs hanging on their ribs. And I'm sitting there and saying, I looked down at the Quaker Roads, and it came back all, all of a sudden, the smell of the oats. And the old man's sitting there. He's drinking his coffee and smoking his cigarette. And, and uh, the, it, it hit me again. And without any warning, up it started to come. Ooh, ooh, I rush into the job. 
Look at the... It's like the triple third effect. <laughs> well, another 15-minute session, and now it is about 11 o'clock in the morning. I am 26 pounds lighter, which wasn't easy because I only weighed 42. I'm 26 <laughs> pounds lighter. <laughs> I'm pale and wan, and I'm staring out of the window in my bedroom where I'm now back in my pajamas, and I've been put to bed. And I begin to look back over the day. And I have never stopped. Which means that day, that day forever convinced me it forever changed my attitude towards all kinds of highs. <laughs> all kinds. I mean, all kinds. It was, it was a fantastic purity. A pure, pure creation. Well, of course, each one of us had these things that happened to us. From time. Some, some learn things from them, others don't. Some walk on and some don't. But uh, I never could forget that feeling of just total nausea. Like as if my whole body was made out of some kind of just, you know what nausea is like. You've had it now. I mean, everybody's had this thing. And it's just unforgettable. There was only one other time that I would say that I came close to having the same kind of bomb hit me. Complete. And again, this was a curative moment. A few years later. All right? I'm in my late teens. And now I am very lucky, very fortunate, uh, tremendously lucky. Uh, I have gotten myself a job at Inland Steel. You've heard of Inland Steel? Well, I worked at Inland Steel. See, it's summertime. Now, for those of you who don't know anything about the steel mill, I'm going to have to give you a little, a little preface to the steel mill world. The steel mill world is a self-contained world. It's, it's not just a plant. It's not just a job. It's not just the factory. Well, all right, here I am, Sam. I'm, uh, that's one, one thing. It, it's tough to work in a steel mill, especially if you work in certain departments of a steel mill. Now, remember this, again, about a steel mill. It is a self-contained world, which means that the kind of guy that works in a steel mill ranges all the way from the, uh, the clerk who never sees a piece of steel. He works somewhere way out in the uh, outer, outer uh, reaches of the mill someplace, and all he does all day long is fill in figures and work a... A computer. Uh, he, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a white collar worker, and he really uh, and he he looks different, and he really doesn't have anything to do with the, with the steel workers. And then as you get closer to the core of the steel mill, this great fantastic living city, the steel mill that I worked in was right on the shore of Lake Michigan, and it stretched over acres and acres, miles. You could go for miles in the steel mill and never leave the mill. As a matter of fact, the longest privately owned railroad. Now get this, the longest privately owned railroad in the United States is in the steel mill in Gary, Indiana. It's miles and miles, there's tremendous diesel engines roaring around, and it's a trem it's it's just a it's a whole city. And it and it has everything involved. It's got a big hospital. I mean a real hospital where people stay for not just the safety department. It's got a hospital. It's got a tremendous commissary where food is served all over the place and all kinds of little uh, cafeterias. It's got its own uh, supermarket inside, but it sells steel mill stuff. It's got a great a place called the stores, the number one stores, the number two stores. You get out of the number one stores, and it's like a, a it's like a department store for workers, and and uh, they sell things like safety helmets. Uh, they sell stuff like uh, safety shoes, you know, with the steel toes. They sell uh, asbestos vests and all kinds of stuff. And you come down to here, it's all uh, models. You know, you walk in and you can say, oh, that's a very nice, look at that new safety helmet, Fred. And, oh, I like the purple one up there, Charlie. And, uh, you can buy these things and, and, uh, that's the, the, the kind of steel mill you never hear of. And of course, then the, there's the other side. There's the big hundred inch plate mill. Now, what is a hundred inch plate mill? Well, this is a tremendous mill that uh, is dark and menacing and is long. And this is quite often seen in movies. That's where the rolling operation goes on. You know, the big rolling thing where the ingots come in and boom, and they roll back and forth. Well, this is where they're making plate steel. Now, the 100 inch refers to the 100 inches wide. They can, uh, the roller is, a, is 100 inches wide. It can make a, a plate that wide. It's a tremendous mill. Then there's the 14 inch merchant mill. Well, the 14 inch merchant mill means merchant meaning they make all kinds of pieces of steel, various job lots of steel, different widths, up to 14 inches. Well, that covers a lot of territory. A lot of rods, a lot of flat pieces of metal, all kinds. Then there's the cold strip. That's a great sighting. Cold strip sounds like a, a stripper that works in Greenland. 
uh, the coal, <laughs> the coal strip mill is a mill where they, they literally roll out metal using a cold process. Uh, and this is the kind of metal you have in tin cans, Al, well, in case you're curious. Uh, that's, that's coal strip rolled. And, uh, this is very thin, and it's rolled in great, uh, well, tremendous spools. It looks like a great roll of metal. And it weighs tons, actually, this thing, but it's all cold rolled, and it's uh, usually a grayish, silverish color before it's plated or processed. Then there's the tin plate mill, where they plate this metal. And uh, the tin plate, of course, is what you eventually get in your tin cans. That's uh, uh, really, the tin can is not made of tin, you know. If they were to make a tin can out of tin, the tin can, the average tin can that you get, would be worth maybe $25. That's right. <laughs> Tin is one of the most expensive metals in the world. And, uh, yeah, it's right up there with silver. And uh, what you do get, though, uh, is a very fine, sometimes just a molecule thick, a fine coating of tin is placed on thin steel. And that's what you call tin. That's what people call tin. Tin is not, in, in its, in its uh, pure form, tin is something like uh, lead foil. Uh, you know how lead foil is? You've seen the uh, Reynolds wrap on that. It happens to be tin foil, but actually that's an alloy. That's just got a little bit of tin in it and a lot of aluminum. But uh, anyway, we get to, <laughs> we're getting into, into metallurgy here, which is beyond the scope of this course, friends. Okay. Well, anyway, here's this fantastic operation of steel mills. Just a, there's no end to it, and there's no end. There's no one man who knows the steel mill. It's just like uh, old, you know, Thomas Wolfe's old line: "Only the dead know Brooklyn." Well, that's true. There's no one man can know Brooklyn, and no one man can know Manhattan. You may know the streets, but all the fantastic things that go on within this thing, that uh, there are things going on in Manhattan right now that even Lindsay couldn't conceive of. I mean, the most on top of it person can only know a tiny portion of this world, of Manhattan or Brooklyn or the steel mill. Well, I was fortunate. I was working as a as a as a mail boy, we ran in the, into every department of the mill. We carried the mail. Now, a mail boy in the steel mill is not like a mail boy in an office. He is actually out running a route, just like a, a mailman that you know uh, on your mail job. And he runs all day long. He runs in and out of all these fantastic places. I remember running up and down the the uh, the blast furnace, which is a tremendous structure. You've seen pictures of blast furnaces. I used to run up this this great ladder that goes up the side of this structure, the, just straight up. It's a metal ladder uh, with with metal rungs. You can see the ground below you. This thing is about ten stories high. Running up the side of this thing, and you can see the ground getting further and further away. Until finally, you know, we had a, we had a, a myth that when, once you, myth it was truth. Once you got past a certain meter on the side of the uh, on the side of the blast furnace, don't look down because you get vertigo. You, you, and off you go. They had lost two mailboys the year before doing that, just right off the side. So you run up the top of this thing, and he has a little tiny office with two guys sitting ten stories above at the top of this fantastic blast furnace. And all they had was meters on the side. They keep t uh, filling out forms about these fantastic meters that were all over the walls. And you'd give them this envelope, then you'd run down this thing again. And then you'd run into the coal strip, you'd run into the hot plate. And so the, 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 the day was one great mosaic, just... He never could really focus on anything. He was just running, running, running into this in and out and in and out, always different sights and scenes, and always around everything, this fantastic noise. The steel mill is a, an enormous symphony of sound. The ground just shudders in some areas, and no matter where you are in the mill, you can hear it distantly. It's like living on a volcano, really. And in many ways, there's a good analogy there. There is lava <laughs> in the steel mill. There is uh, molten metal, and there is fantastic heat. So this world was, was a world of tremendous sights and sound. You never never uh, stop. And inside of each mill, of course, were the specific workers who worked in that mill and were very much specialists. And so guys that worked in the open hearth were really specialists in what they did. I'm not talking about the metallurgists. I'm talking about the laborers. They knew exactly what they were doing. The guys that worked in the 100-inch plate mill, they were specialists in what they did. And amid all of this were these great machines, fantastic rolls, enormous uh, banks of relays, tremendous ovens. Of course, the row on row, the open hearth is what most people know about. And yet very few people know anything about the open hearth. They think it's this big ladle that pours. Well, the open hearth is a whole series of ovens that stretch maybe sometimes 36. We have 36 open hearths in one bank, a great bank of ovens. And they're coke-operated, gas and coke-operated. And uh, they had these, uh, the, the ovens are lined with ceramic. 
which have to be replaced every six weeks, and it's a hellish job replacing the ceramics. And so when the, you see this bank of 36 ovens, there's only about 24 of them that are running at any given time because the others are having the ceramic replaced. They do it in rotation. And you walk along that open heart floor, and it's one of the most dramatic places in the world. I remember one day walking along the open heart floor in a big charging car had moved along, and they're charging the open heart. That's like putting stuff in the oven, really. They're putting uh, manganese and metal and so forth. It just goes in. It's a big arm that just reaches into this seething volcano and just lowers this stuff in. Well, I was about, I'd say, a half a mile away because the open heart floor is about a mile long. It's a tremendous building. Well, I'm about a half a mile when I see this row of charging cars up there working away, and one big charging arm went into a went into a, an oven and it was just like something, because I've been seeing this for a long time. You just don't really watch it after a while. And it, it's out of the corner of my mind. The one thing when you live with constant danger, you know, uh, this is the difference between the pro and the amateur, that he de- the, the pro doesn't have to watch to know there's danger. He always knows it, he senses it, and he, he's very aware of it all the time, even though he just seems to be playing something totally uh, irrelevant. He may be playing pinochle. But he knows, you see. And so I had been around the steel mill enough to know, and uh, I could see about a half a mile away, I saw these charging cars moving in, just moving along this rail, putting these things in. And uh, without, without any warning, the charging car goes in, I see there's a split second, and then all of a sudden, <laughs> whap, an explosion. The entire front of the furnace just blew out. And this great, tremendous gout of flame just, <laughs> Like a, like some kind of a, an unimaginable blowtorch. And there was a, a, a tremendous wave of, of uh, material, molten lava that just poured out of this thing. And workers running, uh, like ants, tremendous crowd of work. And instantly the sirens began to go off. And it was a, it was an explosion in the open heart. So this is the kind of world that the steel mill is. It's a, it's a, <laughs> it's a fascinating world. But the people who work in it are a special kind of guys. Of course, like they live with the danger all the time. And they live with heat all the time. It produces a different kind of man. He is a man who never complains about things like cold. <laughs> I've never heard of steel mill guys. Oh, how cold it is. How cold it is, hockey today. What is this? Uh, you know, that's part of the life that he lives in. Hot, cold, uh, rainy. It's all part of the same scene. Explosions. That's all part of the game. And so they're very different. Well, I am a kid. It's the first, about the first month I'm working in the steel mill. And I am just gassed at this thing. I can't stop looking. I'm running all day long. Well, one day, I'm a, I'm a mail boy. And I live with the mail boys. I, I, I just, that's our little crew. And everybody was uh, close and so on. That was the end of it. But I had very little to do with the actual steel workers. I'd see them. These great, tough guys out there in the open art. These tremendous, hardened, gnarled, bronzed characters who worked in the plate mill. They were a very special crime. You just went past them. See, they would pay no attention to you. Well, one day, Mr. Moss, who ran the mail department, he says, uh, listen, any of you guys want to pick up a special, want to pick up an extra day Saturday? We didn't work on Saturdays. You want to pick up an extra day in a, in a, uh, labor gang Saturday? I just got a call that they need some guys to work in a labor gang. And I said, uh, some of you guys might want to do it. You want to pick up an extra day? Yeah. An extra day. Well, an extra day means getting, putting in a day in the labor gang as a casual. They just stick you in. And so that Saturday, I showed up at the mill wearing my safety helmet, my steel shoes, the whole bit, which I rarely wore as a mail boy, my goggles, everything. And five minutes later, I'm in a bus, and I'm heading into the interior of the steel mill. One of these big flat buses they take. In fact, the steel mill is so big that the workers are taking around, taking around in what is the equivalent of big city buses. They're tremendous. Well, they're much bigger than the city buses. They're like great open buses with open, like you see at the world's fairs and that. That's what they really look like. And we're sitting in these buses and I'm surrounded by all these steel workers and they're part of the gang that I'm working with today. And we're working in the number two open heart on the floor. So I'm sitting there saying, I'm my lunch bucket. I'm wearing my helmet. I got my badge on. And we roll out to the open heart. Well, that day was... I just can't describe to you what it was like because it would take too long to describe it. Except that all I did was tag around after guys who move big things. 
<laughs> and who, who, who spoke a language that I couldn't even understand. And they, they just sort of tolerated me. I'm just sort of hanging around. And once in a while, I want them to say, hey, kid, go down to the end. Hey, go, hey kid, go down to the shipping and bring us back some milk. How many of you guys want any milk here, huh? And then they'd put up their hands and I'll give you the dough and I'd run down to get the milk. That's all I did, you know, that kind of stuff. Well, that night, we finished our trick. And I went into there. They have like a, a dressing room for the steel workers. And all their clothing is hung up from the ceiling. They have, they have cables going. Each guy has a lock. And they don't have regular lockers. They have things that go way up to the top so that nobody can steal them, see? And they hang from the ceiling. They're like 500 feet up. You see all these suits hanging up there. And uh, showers and all this, these tough guys sitting around. Talk about, talk about the jets. Dressing room. You should see these steel workers' dressing room. Here are these gigantic guys with hair on their chest. I mean, enormous. 270 pound guys all sitting around there and uh, they're drinking their Pepsi Cola and uh, wearing their, you know, they're wearing their jockey shorts and sweating and they're taking showers. Well, I'm sitting with these guys waiting for the bus. And they've gotten, now they put their jackets back on, they've taken their helmets off, and all their stuff is stowed away. The bus picks us up and we go rolling. And they start talking. Hey, hey, Aki! Yeah. Hey, Arky, you going over to the Eagle today? Yeah, I'll see you at the Eagle. Let's go to the Eagle. Well, what's the Eagle? Well, right across from the number one gate was the Eagle Bar and Grill. And friends, the Eagle Bar and Grill was one place in my long, checkered life, one place where another important lesson was learned. The Eagle Bar and Grill. And they had this great big Golden Eagle in a decal on the window. Right across from the number number two clock house. Well, not a clock house is where all the steel workers come pouring out and they punch their time cards and they run and try to get their bus to get back to the house, right? Well, we come rushing. There I'm with the open heart, the open heart, the labor, the, what they call the open heart roving labor team. And we come running out all these guys named Aki and Clarence and Zudok and all, you know, old names like Kostash and Alec. And we come running out like man. Everybody's punching his car, and they pour across the street into the Eagle Bar and Grill, oh, like like one big unit. They rush into the Eagle Bar and Grill because the bus doesn't come for half an hour, and this is where they all go every day. Well, what was the Eagle Bar and Grill? They had wooden planks laid out on sawhorses. It was an empty store, and half of the wooden planks, right? I mean, half were covered with water glasses, just as closely packed as they could be. Each water glass filled to the top with raw, rough Kentucky bourbon. Now, behind the bartenders, there were about six bartenders wearing white aprons. They had about ten big barrels of beer. And as these guys came pouring into this joint with all the sawdust on the floor, a tremendous crowd of guys, they'd grab one of these, they'd throw down a dollar bill, they'd grab one of these gigantic water glasses full of bourbon, and he'd take a stein of this beer in the other hand, and first he'd take the bourbon, <laughs> then he'd take the beer. That's why they call them boilermakers. Because boilermakers drink them. That's a boilermaker, you know. Well, I come rushing in with these guys. I'm right with them, you know. I want to be one of the boys, see. <laughs> and, and I remember Big Stash, who was the foreman of the gang, he said, hey, kid, I want to, you want a drink? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You want a drink? Oh, I can't give her. Here, here's another buck. He throws the buck out. And I, the next thing I know, I've got this glass, this big water glass, big water glass full of bourbon. I didn't know what the stuff was. It was just sort of, you know, brown stuff, big water glass. And I've got a big stein of beer, which looked like Dad's old-fashioned root beer, you know? I got this big beer, and he says, here, watch. And up, down he goes with his, up, down goes the beer. So I'm, you know, I'm one of the boys. I take this big glass of bourbon. Down the hatch it goes. Boom! Tongue of fire went down into my guts. I can see why they drink that beer. I took a glass of that beer and I just drank it right down. Uh, uh, my eyes are watering. And these guys are knocking these things down as fast as they can drink them. Stash says, here, kid, have another one. Down goes another one. Boom! The birds began to sing somewhere deep inside of me. Birds twittered. My eyes watered. I could feel my stomach turning over and over like a Zeppelin was under rapid anti-aircraft fire. <laughs> well, I went out and waited for the bus. And it was coming back again. That terrible thing that had happened to me 
when I was building the Stinson SR-7. I recognized it. It was so familiar. I was feeling kind of good. I was singing a little bit. <laughs> Yet there was something way down deep inside of me that says, Here it comes. Here it comes. Keep your mouth shut. Don't, don't throw it all over the bus. Here it comes. Here it comes. And all around me were Stosh, Alec, Big Howie, the whole gang from the number two open heart roving labor gang, the day shift. Covered with stubble, these guys have been drinking double bourbons, followed by triple beers ever since they were nine years old. This stuff was mother's milk to these guys. <laughs> Halfway home in the bus, I knew I couldn't stop. It was coming up. Have you ever had that terrible, embarrassing feeling of getting sick on a bus with a lot of people, ladies with shopping bags and all that? Here I'm sitting there, and I feel it coming up. We, we pull to a stop in front of some A&P, a totally alien neighborhood. We're only halfway home. I said, get up, get up. I struggle to the door. I go out of the door, and I didn't even make it. I'm, I'm just halfway down the steps. <laughs> heard this lady behind me. A lady was getting up. She said, oh, man, look at that pig. It's another one of those awful steel workers. Those people that... <laughs> and incidentally, that was a secret, subtle compliment. Suddenly, I found myself one of those awful steel workers. But ever since that time, ever since that time, I carry with me indelible lessons... Ever since that time, these are called traumatic incidents. These are called traumatic moments. And those were two of them. W.O.R. New York.